Hey guys, welcome to me reacting to Game Theory FNAF 4 The Body Snatchers five, FNAF the, by the Game Theorists. Now, I think this is about the body snatch. So yeah, this is about the body snatchers with the whole Toy Freddy, I think, with the last video. I think that's what it was, and there was like an army of Toy Freddies or something like that, maybe. But yeah, anyways, guys, Rogue Jinx and the make sure to subscribe to the game for your slang. So, anyways, let's get right into it now. He's your buddy. Oh, yeah. Is a jerk. He's your pal. When your dad is off at work, he won't leave <laughs> you. When you go get a bite, at least until the sixth night. He's here, he's there, he's uh, everywhere. everywhere. Who you gonna call? Uh, Psychic friend, Fred, Fred, Bear. Fred Bear. Yeah. He's a flower for reasons still unknown, and he stalks you. On your way back home, he makes a promise that throws off all the lore. Seriously, Scott, what is this line for? And is it supposed to be in a slightly different yellow font here? Are you meaning this to be figurative or literal? Because if it's literal, you are opening up a literal can of worms. He's here. He's Check. there, he's everywhere. he's everywhere. Who you gonna call? call Psychic, Psychic friend, friend bear. Bear, bear. Nice. Here he's there, okay. he's everywhere. I... Who you gonna call? Psychic friend, Fred Bear. I get it. Oh god! Hello internet, welcome to Game Theory, where I start off today with a disclaimer. <clears throat> Warning, what? in entering this video the and following all of my theories, you are entering a zone of speculation where yeah. idea is valid for consideration in the hopes that it solves more problems than it creates, answers more questions than it raises, or ties together dangling pieces of evidence in a narratively satisfying way. Am I trying to solve the lore? Yes. Am I doing it by asking really extreme over-the-top questions, looking into very specific details way too closely, and more often than not drawing connections between concepts that probably aren't connected? Connected at all? Absolutely. Yes. Side effects of yeah. the game zone may include a blown mind, total and utter confusion, a deeper appreciation of your favorite franchises, fun stories to share with friends, a head full of random factoids that well, will aid you in life, and disillusionment of I mean, your own place in the universe. Enter at your yeah, own like, flavors aside, theory crafting is a tricky hmm. needle to thread. A he good does sometimes answer, like, he does sometimes bring up more so questions than answers. It's basically a known fact. It requires extrapolation, thinking beyond just the stuff <laughs> we're given, yeah, but not so man behind the slaughter. that that you're overreaching or making basic claims and all of them are still <laughs> Sans. a satisfying story a story that stays true to the franchise that you're talking about while not being afraid to take that known story in new often riskier directions true. in a lot of ways theory crafting is like writing fan fiction just you know with more evidence and uh less aggressive cuddling a lot less aggressive cuddling than uh. some of the fan fictions i've been exposed to over the years Anyway, the reason that I say all of this right now is that today's theory is... Uh, nice. How do I put it? it? It's one of the stretchier ones. Oh, There's no. That are rock solid. There's some really strong evidence in the game, and it's supported by stuff that's been said by the developers or creators. Then there are others that require a bit more creative license, where the connections are there, but they might require you to squint a little bit, or just, you know, have fun with it and go along for the ride. And this episode is one yeah. of those theories. Because he he has those a lot, I feel like. Fetch. Book two of the Fazbear Fright series. You see, last time I mentioned this, Fetch was recently released and it, yeah. um, well, if I'm being honest, it feels much less connected to the series than the first one. The connections to the main lore are definitely a bit shakier. This one, meanwhile, introduces us to a lot of new things. A smartphone-powered animatronic dog named Fetch. Tiny, free-roaming versions of Freddy yeah. Fazbear called Lonely Freddy. And that felt weird to me. Every story of the first book felt very connected to established characters from golden bunny suits to shape-shifting baby to funtime freddy so why was this one the second hmm. book doing so many new things it sparky like yeah. extreme tonal shift especially considering scott had just posted about how these books would fill in some of the blanks from the past so then i thought about hmm. it and i considered what blanks from the past this odd collection of stories might be trying to fill and something clicked i think that there's a chance that one of the new inclusions in this book is actually something that we've known about for a long time. An oddball character that's confused us and stymied our theories. And 
entered. Years, I believe that there's a chance, oh. a chance that Fetch's Lonely Freddy's may actually be the real identity of FNAF 4's psychic friend Fredbear. You remember that plush doll from FNAF 4 with the living eyes that tracked your movements as you walked around the room, that stalked you in the streets and disguised itself as a flower? The thing oh, yeah. that actually read the crying child's innermost thoughts. I think that guy was a type of Lonely Freddy doll. But to truly understand why I think these two are connected, let's begin with Lonely Freddy's story. To quickly recap this story in a bit more detail than I did last time, because now the details actually matter for the theory, Alec is an angry teenager who's upset that his younger sister Hazel gets all of their parents' love and affection because she's practically perfect in every way. So when Hazel, just out of the blue, starts being overly nice to Alec and wants to join him in making their parents miserable, he doesn't trust her. He suspects that she's up to something, and so he concocts a plan to expose her for being a spoiled brat at her upcoming birthday party, which happens at, wouldn't you know it, the local Freddy yeah. Fazbear's Pizza. His plan, well, it's not a particularly good one, and if I have to fault this story for one thing, it's that the mechanics of how it all works is kind of confusing, so stay with me here. At Freddy's, Wait, they what? have this big money booth. You know, those clear boxes. Chuck E. Cheese. Uh, all these tickets around you. And you yeah. Try to grab them, and you walk away with whatever you're able to capture in the booth. Yeah. In the booth, there's a special ticket that allows you to win the top prize in the restaurant. A Yarg Foxy. Basically, a large foxy doll with extra hook-swinging action. Okay, so it seems like Hazel really wants to win the Yarg Foxy, so Alex sabotages her chances by taking out the special winning ticket before she gets in. Except, she does win. By some weird, magical, unexplained miracle, the ticket winds up in her hair, and she wins the Foxy doll. The twist, though, is that she didn't want to win it for herself. She wanted to win it for Alex. You see, Alex secretly loves Freddy's Pizzeria, but he never gets to have his birthday there. And of all the characters, he loves Foxy the most, even pretending to be Yarg Foxy around the house when no one's looking. But when Hazel tries to give it to him as a sign of friendship, as a way to try oh. and finally make him happy, all it does is infuriate him. Once more bested by his perfect sister, Alec loses it, he rips the Foxy doll and runs off to the storage room crying. Once there, he meets a lonely Freddy doll, a small free roaming version oh, of the okay. bear. The bear hypnotizes him and then body swaps with him, leaving Alex's consciousness trapped forever in the doll's body while an AI with his face roams free yeah. unannounced to his family. So forgive me the detailed plot description, but I needed to get all that in because Alex's story, strangely enough, closely matches what we see happening in FNAF 4's Crying Child. Now, I don't kind of is the Crying Child. No, 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 no. Yeah, I agree with that. No, 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 no. Call out how similar these two stories are. They are kind of similar, but eh. they seem to be inviting us to compare these two stories. So let's do exactly. They're not the that. same person. Just like but... in FNAF 4, there's a countdown to a birthday party happening at Freddy's I'll just turn that the on. week. Though in this case, it's a sister's party and not his. Speaking of the sister, Alex's younger sister Hazel is described as being cute and perfect, with a lot of emphasis being placed on her green eyes and her curly yellow hair. An important physical description, considering Elizabeth, the girl who would go on to possess baby and who we assume is crying child's sister and owner of this room in FNAF 4 is also blonde with green eyes. In fact, eye color is brought up a lot. An unusual Ooh. amount throughout the Lonely Friends. That looks story. really it's creepy. Like this. Alec had never oh! seen his eyes before. Had they always been that blue? And again, its eyes were as blue and deep as an ocean trench. Over 13 times our eyes in this story qualified by their color, which is worth noting considering that a lot of the other short stories thus far in Fazbear Frights have had themselves pretty sparse character descriptions. But this one, for some reason, really chooses to emphasize the fact that Alec and Hazel have green eyes and that Lonely Freddy oh. has blue eyes, which, if you have an obsessive level of knowledge of the series, should ring a few alarm bells. In Sister Location, eye color was a huge deal, so much so that I did a whole theory about it back when Sister Location True. came out, where the baby animatronic had blue eyes until she scooped Elizabeth and her eyes turned green. And here we have something very similar happening. Quote from the story. Alex stared hard into the blue eyes of Lonely Freddy. Eyes that had burned through his Yeah, wait. So does his eyes turn blue? Wait a minute. With more did it? Did it? No. <laughs> yeah, I know. I'll mention that. Sans? Green. End quote. 
And again, oh yeah, Alec could see was the bear as its newly green eyes bore through him. So we've got a, Ooh, party, a sister. That's a very eyes. weird well, description. See, there's got to be more, right? Alec, when his plan fails, runs off to hide in the storage room, crying, similar to the crying child being locked oh, in yeah. the storage room in FNAF 4. And in general, Alec is just a sulky, moody kid who, similar to our crying child, both loves and hates Freddy Fazbear's. Alec, in the book, secretly loves the restaurant and its characters, but he also hates it because he only gets to go when it's for his sister, which makes him bitter and angry to be there. It's a lot like the conflicted feelings our crying child has for the restaurants, who clearly likes the franchise. I mean, he has all the toys in his room, and yet while he's there, he's clearly miserable. We're not exactly sure why, but he does have mixed feelings about this franchise. Kind of like me, that is hashtag relatable. I feel seen, crying child, but to me, one of the most telling connections between this story and the game is the Yarg Foxy toy. When Hazel tries to give the toy Oh, it's ripped! Alex the head is and rips the toy. The head is gone. It's a small detail, but one that immediately made me think of the Foxy Yeah! The Crying Child's FNAF 4. Wait! Movie, a Foxy plush with one very specific feature. A feature that has never Its never, head is gone. Explained, its head was pulled off. So, yeah. we ourselves two Foxy plushies, both with a body part Part ripped off in some way in the possession of a kid who both loves and hates Freddy's that why they're not the same person but their stories are very similar so that's what he's trying to say sister with blonde hair it is just an oddly specific series of parallels that are almost so precise they're inviting us to compare them it's actually a bit uncanny Alec in this story is almost like a fusion of the crying child and his brother you see crying child for all the reasons that we just talked about but also the old Older brother because well he's a mean older brother to his sister and his favorite character is Foxy so much so that he pretends to be Foxy around the house just like we see the older brother doing to torment the crying child in FNAF 4 again it's not exactly the same there are plenty of differences yeah. between these two scenarios but there are a lot of parallel details almost like alternate universe versions of roughly the same series of events so what does True. Have to do with psychic friend Fred Bear. Well, I believe that all of these parallels with FNAF 4 are intentional. They're drawing lines between the two stories, inviting us to compare them. And when you do that, it becomes undeniable that psychic friend Fred Bear is a Lonely Freddy. To understand why, let's start with the book. This is how Lonely Freddy is first described. Quote, it was a weird name for a toy, but the weirdest parts of it were harder to define. The bear stood stiff, almost at attention. Its eyes stared straight ahead at the stage, but Alec had the strangest feeling that it was still watching him. And oh. so a small Freddy toy with That's eyes so and creepy as you move around the room. Definitely Why? Like what Psychic Friend does as we maneuver our way through oh, the yeah. mini games. His white eyes just move yeah, around wait. Us wherever we go. We're also told that the lonely Freddy is able to free roam in order to follow the kids around. Again, explaining why he shows up in practically every True. screen of the FNAF 4 mini games. It is literally designed to be a moving surveillance camera. I mean, maybe it can't disguise itself as a flower or whatever, but just chalk that one up to Scott's artistic license. Later in the story, we're told what the purpose of the Lonely Freddy is. Quote again, At Freddy Fazbear's, we believe that no child should have to experience the wonder and delight of Freddy Fazbear's family pizzeria alone. Using patented technology and a touch of that Freddy Fazbear magic, Freddy will learn all about your child's favorite things just like a true friend. Aunt Gigi leaned close to their mom. Is it just me or does Lonely Freddy sound like the cure for the unwanted kid? It's a mechanical last resort. Resort, as in, no one wants to play with this kid, so here's a machine that'll do it instead, end quote. This is a device specifically designed to become a friend to sad and lonely children. Children just oh. like a crying child. Children just like Alec. And in a line, again drawing parallels between the I two I like the purple and green because this, quote, if there was ever nobody, a kid who would have those are two colors that go great together. At a birthday party, it would have been Alec. Now, this is important. One of the strangest things about psychic friend Fred Bear in the game was his knowledge of crying children child's innermost thoughts, saying things like, remember what you saw, and he hates you. It's the whole reason I started calling him Psychic Friend Fredbear in the first place. The toy's knowledge of what was going on inside the boy's head was just uncanny.
Sammy. Just one of the many strange <laughs> things about this character. One of the many strange things about this character that gets an explanation via Lonely Freddy's behavior True. in the story. The bear approaches Alec in the storage room and starts asking questions. Questions that start to turn serious. Quote from the book, I've been waiting for you, friend, the bear said. We should be best friends. It's a stuffed animal, Alec told himself. It's a stuffed toy. What's your favorite color? My favorite color is green. What's your favorite food? Lasagna. Then the bear's questions took a different turn. What would you do if you were asked to hurt someone you love? It felt like the bear was reaching its soft plush paw into his very soul and extracting the answers he kept the most hidden. And it was doing it so effortlessly. So the Lonely Ooh. Freddy is a stuffed bear designed to act as a surveillance camera on kids. Follow them around, talk to the sad lonely ones, and then extract information from them to become their friend before eventually body swapping with them. I mean, each and every one of those details, minus the whole body swap thing, is something that we see the psychic friend Fred Bear do. Oh yeah, except for body one swap, last but... detail that I haven't included yet. The Freddies are controlled by a man who works in a private backroom office. Quote again, the man behind the slaughter is... ...on her hip-clipped walkie-talkie and pressed her finger to her headset. Someone get Daryl to do a Lonely Freddy demo. Daryl's on break. The fact that there's someone behind the scenes controlling these devices in the book is a direct callback to the secret private room from Sister Location. The one where there were surveillance cameras watching the FNAF 4 house, guarded by the password 1983. It was in that room that we saw a psychic friend Fredbear for the first and only time in a non-8-bit setting. There, on the desk, was a short little plushie with his white little surveillance eyes and a walkie-talkie well, next to him. Well, mm, that's kind of a stretch, but... So there you have it, it is understandable, but it is a little bit of a stretch. Lonely Freddy. It's not quite as fun, but I guess it's easier for me to type, so that's a plus. It's a camera system controlled by someone hidden in a back surveillance room. A system that has the ability to walk and talk and maybe even hypnotize and body swap. Now, the question that we're left with is who was controlling it in FNAF 4? I mean, it seems like the obvious answer here should be William Afton, right? Who else would... The man behind the slaughter. The bigger question is why? Please. Why would he be doing all this just to watch what we assume is his own son. And then over in Bookland, the question is whether all of this is intentional. It seems like the employees don't actually know the true nature of these robots. So is this an AI roaming around? Or was a normal Lonely Freddy swapped out for one with body snatching abilities? That one seems like yeah. a scenario considering in story number three, out of stock, the plush trap chaser is swapped with an evil one with human body parts. So maybe William Afton or some of his people in this book universe are slowly seeding out evil animatronics into the world to run as little test cases. Also, since I'm wrapping up my oh! here, something else for you to chew on. At Hazel's birthday party, there's a girl named Charlotte. A girl who shares a name with the who we know goes on to possess the puppet. A girl who, in this story, is allergic to chocolate and accidentally eats some and then spends the rest of the party vomiting. Could this oh. actually give us an explanation for why Charlotte in the games would end up outside of the party, outside of the restaurant, when we see her in FNAF 6, before she eventually gets killed and turned into a puppet? It may be. It's just a thought that I'm yeah. throwing out there into the universe for everyone to pick up. Yeah. But with Fetch out of the way, it's time to look ahead. Because based on the descriptions, it's books number four and five coming out later this year that seem like they may hold the biggest lore reveals yet. In book four's description, we see that one of the main characters will have the name Susie. If she also has herself a dog, Susie is almost guaranteed to be confirmed as our Fruity Maze girl. And our oh. victim, the one who goes on to possess Chica. We also yeah. know that one of the book four stories will be about Pete and his younger brother who, quote, get in a fight in the wake of their parents' divorce and fall prey to a gruesome curse. Huh. Two brothers with divorced parents that have some blood curse on their family? Seems like it could be another stand-in for our crying child and foxy bro getting wrapped up in the cycle of serial killing their father started decades prior. And then flipping over yeah, the book five. The description, quote, in room 1280 of Heracles Hospital, something evil is keeping a man alive. A man with gruesome burns all over his body and an iron will to live. Sounds a lot like our good old buddy William. Or it could be the aftermath yeah, of Nexus's restaurant burning. With that being the last book in the Fazbear Fright series, I'd expect that one to tie up a lot of different loose ends. So, yeah, honestly, see, yeah, I do kind of agree that this is more of a stretch theory, but he did have some evidence to prove it, at least. But, yeah, there were some things that were a little bit of a stretch, and honestly, like, yeah, what he is saying is that, like, the, it is meant to 
answer more questions than create questions. So that is, you know, understandable. It, it's just that a few videos I feel like they create more questions than answer questions. I feel like that is something with game theory. But honestly, I mean, yeah, I understand. I understand. I mean, when it comes to game theory haters, I understand them. But at the same time, it's it's not like honestly, I don't I don't you know, I'm not like I don't love game theory, but I understand. And I understand the haters, but I don't hate it either. So it's kind of like, I, I have a so-so, uh, you know, opinion about game theory. Now, film theory, I, I don't like. But, uh, yeah, anyways, guys, I'm really liking me to share my channel. See you in the next one. Bye! <laughs>